I want to welcome back those who joined us yesterday. Welcome to those who are just joining today. I'm Angela Bradbury from the University of Pennsylvania. This is the workshop on contemporary issues in human subjects protections and cancer research. Thanks so much for being here. We have two excellent sessions for day two, including ethical oversight of clinical effectiveness assessments. And the last session is challenges and successes of review and oversight of multicenter trials. We have um, coffee and breakfast on the side, so please feel free to um, step up and enjoy during the first session. I have the pleasure of introducing my colleague from the University of Pennsylvania, Steve Joffe, who will be the moderator for the first session. He is the Emanuel and Robert Hart Associate Professor of Medical Ethics and Health Policy at the University of Pennsylvania Perlman School of Medicine. And he also recently was appointed Vice Chair of the department as well. So congratulations. And he'll be leading us through the first session this morning. Uh, thank you, uh, Angela. So as many of you probably know, uh, there's been a great deal of discussion over the past a uh, year or so, and perhaps a bit more than a year, about uh, learning healthcare systems and uh, the ethics and oversight of research in learning healthcare systems, uh, and how our current uh, sets of rules and regulations fit that uh, that setting. So uh, that will be the subject of our uh, panel this morning. Uh, to give you just a, a moment of uh, how I frame these issues, uh, you all know that um, research uh, is defined, and this came up yesterday, as a systematic investigation. Uh, including research development, testing, and evaluation designed to develop or contribute to generalizable knowledge. And when something legitimately gets defined as research, there's a set of rules and regulations that govern uh, the conduct and oversight of that activity. But of course, research is set in context and overlaps with lots of other activities uh, that raise some interesting issues that will be the focus of our panel. So the, the first one, which I think we won't say more about, uh, is um, innovative therapy. And this often comes up in the setting of uh, surgical interventions or procedural interventions where, uh, but, but need not come up in that setting. In other words, it can come up in medical settings as well, uh, where uh, somebody uh, wishes to innovate to, to um, sort of change standards of care or deviate from what would be considered the standard approach to a particular uh, issue, often in a prospectively planned way, but sometimes just to respond to things that are thrown at the uh, clinician in the moment. Sometimes, uh, again, this is prospective, and one might look at it and think this ought to be thought of as research and called research and governed as research, uh, but sometimes it just happens as what is called innovative therapy and doesn't, um, uh, doesn't bring with it all of the research requirements or isn't governed by the research requirements that we're familiar with. Another one which will be closer to the subject of our conversation is quality improvement. Uh, and this is another overlapping learning activity, and all of our uh, medical centers and practices and health systems are involved in this. One of the challenges, I've, I've shown it up here on the slide, as though the boundary between quality and uh, improvement and uh, research were clear, but of course it's, it's not clear. And of course there are overlapping uh, activities that can be called at the same time uh, quality improvement uh, and research. There's also a temptation, and, and anecdotally, uh, there's a sense that uh, there's a temptation to call things quality improvement rather than calling them research in order to avoid having to apply uh, the research regulations uh, and the work that comes with that. Now, in oncology, thinking about this uh, research space, we tend to think of drug the drug development continuum, the continuum of phase one uh, to phase three trials. And in oncology, phase, one, phase three trials tend to be efficacy trials. In other words, uh, trials that ask the question, under rigorously controlled situations, does some intervention work better than some comparator? Uh, but we also have this uh, category of what has been called pragmatic trials, and this will be a major focus of uh, Susan Ellenberg's uh, presentation. Uh, which are really uh, trials that are designed to ask whether some intervention is effective under real-world conditions. And one of the advantages of pragmatic trials, among many, is that if you can show that something works in a pragmatic trial setting, there's a good chance that it, it generalizes to the real-world setting. It, it, um, it holds true in the real world under real-world conditions. There's another overlapping set of activities, comparative effectiveness trials. These are trials that classically take uh, two or more interventions or two or more approaches to some sort of uh, diagnosis, therapy, prevention, et cetera, and compare them in order to see which is best. And typically, these are approaches that are used already out there in the world. Uh, and the question is, is one of them better in terms of being safer, more effective, more cost-effective uh, than the other? And the, 
point of showing all of this is that all of these are activities that overlap with each other. There are pragmatic trials that are also comparative effectiveness trials, but there are also trials uh, that are um, separate. And all of this overlaps with quality improvement in ways that we will talk about. I want you to notice um, three things. First of all, all of this happens against a background of clinical care. And although it looks like this is sharply delimited uh, from ordinary clinical care in, in the real world, we all know that it's all often not so easy to see where the boundaries are. And in fact, one of the questions on the table would be, should we be thinking about these boundaries as sharp or not so sharp? Uh, second, of course, as I've said, is that the activities overlap and the boundaries between and among them blur. Uh, and finally, particularly in this space, and this is, I think, a key point, many of the activities actually involve very low incremental risk over and above the risks that uh, participants or patients would be exposed to in the course of their ordinary clinical care, their ordinary cancer care. In some cases, you might even argue no additional risk. And so how do we think about that lower risk space of research? We're not now talking about the phase one and phase two trials of new chemotherapy agents, new targeted agents. We're talking about uh, this space of uh, lower risk activities where the boundaries between these activities and clinical care are, I think, much more uh, blurry. And the focus of our session today will be uh, how we oversee and regulate and how we should oversee and regulate this set of activities. So um, presenting today, we'll have um, first two sessions talking about, or, or two presentations talking about risk-based oversight in a learning healthcare system, uh, first of which will be presented by uh, Ruth Faden, who's the director of the Berman Institute of Bioethics at Johns Hopkins. Uh, followed by Jerry Menikoff, who's the director for the, of the Office for Human Research Protections. Uh, and then uh, Susan Ellenberg uh, will uh, speak about the oversight of pragmatic uh, randomized trials. So with that, let me turn it over to Ruth, uh, and uh, hope you enjoy the session.